Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. This is an evening about faith and the founding, and therefore it is appropriate and meet that we should begin our sermon by asking the congregation to recite our mission, our motto, which is so important. And we're going to do it very beautifully because we have some people here who haven't heard it before. Uh, so here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Wonderful. That's so inspiring. <laughs> it does get you into the mood, doesn't it? There we go. We're having an extraordinary number of nonpartisan uh, programs that will increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution. On November 5th, Ken Starr is coming to discuss his new book. Uh, we will then follow that with a remarkable program on Hamilton, the musical, which will include a reenactment of the trial of Aaron Burr across Independence Mall. And then we culminate on November 28th in the second installment of our partnership with The Atlantic on a constitution in crisis, where Senator Chris Coons will return to the center and we will have leading journalists and scholars ask what Madison would make of American democracy today. So it's gonna be a great fall season. And if you're not, uh, how many people here are members in the National Constitution Center? Wonderful. It is extraordinarily important that you become members. And dear C-SPAN friends, if you're up at 5 a.m. and watching me now, understand that the National Constitution Center is a private nonprofit. We are funded entirely by the engagement, passion, and support of citizens who are hungry for lifelong learning. And I want each of you to join the National Constitution Center as well. All right, we're gonna have a great lecture and then we're gonna have a remarkable panel and it will be introduced by uh, our wonderful, uh, our, our partner for this event uh, and that's Reverend Alan Crippen who is Chief of Exhibits, Programs and Public Engagement for the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center at the American Bible Society. Uh, he and his team have helped us put this program together. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Alan Crippen. Good evening, and thank you, Dr. Rosen, and thank you for all of your wonderful team professionals here at the National Constitution Center. All of us are grateful for the detailed work that has made this evening possible. It's a great honor for the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center to partner with the National Constitution Center in co-hosting tonight's lecture and discussion. The Faith and Liberty Discovery Center is the newest visitor experience coming to Philadelphia. Our plans are to open right here on Independence Mall in late 2020, and we have construction permits in hand. So keep an eye out for the hard hats at the northeast corner of Fifth and Market Streets. The Faith and Liberty Discovery Center's purpose is to explore the relationship between faith and liberty in the American experience. The Discovery Center seeks to understand the nature of that relationship with application to our common life. What do faith and liberty have to do with our mutual pursuit of happiness in seeking a flourishing civil and just society? Recall that in the late 18th century, there was a revolution, a revolution in which faith and liberty had an adversarial relationship. Within a decade, that bloody conflict fostered a dictatorship, world war, and a succession of no less than five constitutional republics. And nearly concurrent with that revolution, however, there was another revolution in which faith and liberty enjoyed a more symbiotic and positive relationship. The other, this other revolution was less bloody and resulted in an extraordinary republic whose constitution still endures and is in fact commemorated by the beautiful exhibits and excellent programs housed here in this magnificent building. I am of course referring to the French and American revolutions respectively. And so with apologies to Charles Dickens, Perhaps there is yet another tale of two cities, Paris and Philadelphia. 
Indeed, there is a Philadelphia tale to discover in exploring the relationship of faith and liberty. Philadelphia's story of faith and liberty may be part of the reason why this city has been distinguished by the United Nations as a world heritage city. Is it conceivable that faith helped guide liberty toward a more just political order? Tonight, we are privileged to explore together the relationship of faith and liberty in the creation of the American Republic. Are there religious origins to American constitutional order? What, if any, is the role of faith in the founding? Our guide in exploring these questions is Dr. Daniel L. Dreisbach. Dr. Dreisbach is a professor in the School of Public Affairs at American University in Washington, D.C. He received a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Oxford University, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar and a Juris Doctorate degree from the University of Virginia. Following law school, he served as a judicial clerk, uh, judicial clerk rather, for the Circuit Judge Robert F. Chapman of the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And for two years, he practiced public interest law, specializing in civil and religious liberties. Professor Dreisbach's research interests include constitutional law and the intersection of politics, law, and religion in American public life. He has authored an, or edited 10 books, including Thomas Jefferson and the Wall of Separation Between Church and State, New York University Press, Faith in the Founders of the American Republic, Oxford University Press, and the Sacred Rights of Conscience, Liberty Fund. Professor Dreisbach's most recent book is Reading the Bible with the Founding Fathers, Oxford University Press. This book is available for purchase and signing after the lecture this evening. The US Supreme Court has cited Dr. Dreisbach's scholarship and he has served as a consultant to the Library of Congress for a major exhibit on religion and the founding of the American Republic. He has been a featured commentator in numerous documentaries, including the recent PBS series, God in America. He is a senior fellow at Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion and a fellow at Emory University's Center for the Study of Law and Religion. Previously, he was a William E. Simon Visiting Fellow in Religion and Public Life in the James Madison Program at Princeton University. Professor Dreisbach is the past recipient, recipient of American University's highest faculty award, the Scholar Teacher of the Year Award. And I'm also pleased to say that Dr. Dreisbach serves as a scholar advisor to the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center here in Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel L. Dreisbach on the topic of Faith in the Founding, the Bible, and the Constitution. Well, thank you very much uh, for that warm welcome, and thank you, Reverend Crippen, for that very kind introduction. And I'm also very, very grateful to the National Constitution Center for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you this evening in this magnificent facility. This evening, I, I want to focus on this question of, did the Bible influence the American constitutional tradition? My thesis is modest, and yet I suspect it will strike some as provocative insofar as it, I think, challenges the prevailing view that one often encounters in the academy. First, let me just say, I, I'm using the word here, Bible, in the same sense it would have been used by Americans by, by late 18th century Protestants here in America. And, and after all, uh, Protestants would have constituted a, the overwhelming uh, percentage of, of the former colonists, probably about 98% or so of all Americans of European descent at that time would have affiliated, identified with uh, some form of Protestantism. So I'm referring here to the canonical texts sacred to the Christian faith. Uh, and by that I'm, I'm referring to uh, the Old and the New Testaments as well as the books commonly called Apocrypha. For purposes of this discussion especially, I want to emphasize this, that this text included the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians call the Old Testament, especially the books of Moses. Uh, 
Uh, and that is because this part of the scriptures, even more than the New Testament, was the text to which 18th century Americans would have turned to for, ins for insights into the establishment of law and civil government. And let me also note parenthetically that most of my references this evening uh, would be to the King James version or the King James translation of the Bible because again, this would have been the English language version of the Bible that most Americans would have been reading in the 18th century. No book, it seems to me, has had a greater influence on Western culture than the Bible. Its expansive influence on public culture, by which I mean language, education, arts, and letters, is well documented. This influence extended to the Western legal tradition. Consider, for example, the influence of the Ten Commandments on law throughout Christendom, including places like Puritan New England. This evening, the question I want to pose and the question I want to examine is, did this influence of the Bible extend to the American constitutional tradition? And more specifically, to the US Constitution? And if so, how was that influence manifested? Early last year, the American Bible Society announced plans to open a Faith and Liberty Discovery Center just across the mall from where we sit this evening. This center promises to provide insights into the Bible's contribution to the American experience. And when this announcement was made, there were questions asked, uh, what will this center, located in the cradle of American independence and constitutional government, interestingly, geographically located about halfway between Independence Hall in the National Constitution Center. What will this center contribute to the story told daily to visitors to this mall? And more to the point, does the Bible have anything to teach us about the American constitutional experiment, this experiment in Republican self-government? Now, I think it's fair to say that the prevailing view in the academy is that the American constitutional experiment that came to fruition here in Philadelphia was a strictly secular project. It is often said that the American founding in the last third of the 18th century or so was a strictly secular project. And yet it's sandwiched between two great religious revivals uh, at a time when uh, enlightenment uh, there in the last third of the 18th century was in the ascend ascendancy. Uh, and revelation, it's often suggested, was rejected or at least relegated to the sidelines. And so again, the question comes, did the Bible, did Christianity more generally influence the constitutional project that takes place here in Philadelphia? In a, pro in a provocative polemic called The Godless Constitution, authored by two Cornell University professors, they make the claim, and I quote, the principal architects of our national government envisioned a godless constitution, end quote. They go on to say that the framers of that document created an utterly secular state, unshackled from the intolerant chains of religion. They say they find evidence for this thesis in the constitutional text itself, which they describe as radically godless and distinctly secular. The University of Pennsylvania law professor, Kermit Roosevelt, recently commented, and again I quote, I'm not sure it's historically accurate to say that the founders drew their thoughts from the Bible. I don't think the US Constitution reflects Christian ideals or doctrine. The Bible is not useful to interpret the Constitution, end quote. In the same vein, historian Stephen Kaler asserted, quote, a remarkably secular convention produced a perfectly secular text. The Constitution was irreligious, it was the product of an irreligious enlightenment, end quote. And these are just a handful of similar statements that one encounters uh, in the scholarly literature of our own age. Notwithstanding this familiar refrain, I contend that the Bible was among the influences that contributed to an American constitutional tradition. A tradition committed to, among other things, rule of law, due process, limited government, separation of powers, checks and balances, Republican self-government, and the right of a people to resist tyrannical rule. Moreover, the Bible featured in the historic events that unfolded on this mall, and more generally in the struggle to establish a new constitutional republic. 
Now, the Bible, to be sure, was not the sole source of the ideas that animated the national founding. And that is not my claim this evening. The founding generation drew on and synthesized a a variety of diverse intellectual traditions and perspectives in forming their political thought. And among these perspectives was British constitutionalism, uh, enlightenment liberalism in a variety of forms, classical and civic republicanism, In my book, uh, Reading the Bible with the Founding Fathers, I contend that the Bible must be studied alongside these other traditions and perspectives if we want to have a rich understanding of the full range of ideas that informed this grand constitutional experiment. Drawing attention to the Bible's contributions to the founding is not meant to diminish, much less dismiss, these other intellectual traditions and influences that I've just mentioned. Rather, as I say, the acknowledgement of the Bible's contributions enriches our understanding of the ideas that informed the founders' political thoughts and shaped their innovative constitutional experiment there at the end of the 18th century. The founding fathers read the Bible There are many quotations from and allusions to both familiar as well as obscure scriptural texts tell us that they knew the Bible from cover to cover. And let's not forget that this was a generation in which many learned to read with a copy of the Bible open in front of them. So again, this is a generation that knew the Bible well. And we find that biblical language and themes liberally seasoned their rhetoric. The phrases and the cadences of the King James Bible especially, and if you know the King James, you know it has this very distinctive rhythm to it, and you hear that rhythm of the King James Bible in much of the literature, in much of the discourse of the American founding. The ideas of the Bible shaped the founding generation's habits of mind and informed their political pursuits. The Bible was an accessible and authoritative text, perhaps the most accessible text for 18th century Americans. And so it's not gonna surprise us that effective communicators like politicians and polemicists often appealed to the Bible in, in an effort to reach, to connect with their audiences. Now let's be very clear here. The mere fact that a founder quoted the Bible does not indicate whether that individual was a believer or a skeptic. Both, including some who doubted the Bible's divine origins and some of the central claims of Christianity appealed frequently to scripture in their political discourse. And and here I might point to something like Thomas Paine in The Common Sense, draws very much on biblical arguments and biblical uh, uh, narratives in advancing his own case in that famous pamphlet. In an often cited uh, uh, study published in the American Political Science Review on the sources referenced by the founding generation in their political literature, the political scientist Donald Lutz reported that the Bible was cited more frequently than any European writer or even any European school of thought, such as the Enlightenment. The Bible, he found, accounted for approximately one-third of the citations in the literature he surveyed. The book of Deuteronomy alone, the fifth book of Moses, was the most frequently cited work, followed by Montesquieu's The Spirit of the Laws. In fact, Deuteronomy was referenced nearly twice as often as all of John Locke's writings put together. And the Apostle Paul, a New Testament writer, was mentioned about as frequently as Montesquieu, again, in the literature, the political literature of the American founding. Given the Bible's pervasive presence in 18th century culture, I don't think it will surprise us, nor should it surprise us, that the founding generation appealed frequently to biblical language and principles in their political discourse and deliberations. The 19th century historian John Wingate Thornton wrote that the Bible, and I quote, was the great political textbook of the patriots, end quote. Not all the founders revered the Bible. 
But even those who doubted Christianity's transcendent claims or the notion that the Bible was divine revelation thought it had something to contribute, something important to contribute to this American experiment in Republican self-government. And let me just note here parenthetically, it is interesting that some of the most skeptical of the American founders were those who were most, uh, uh, most uh, drawn to the use of scripture in their political rhetoric. I've just given the example of someone like Thomas Paine. Benjamin Franklin is another who draws very much in his own writings on, on biblical sources and, and, and biblical uh, allusions and references in the, and the like. So this use of the Bible was not something that was, that was uh, used simply by those who were, uh, we might say, orthodox in their faith commitments. This is something that we see uh, among many of the founders those who are uh, very faithful, as well as those who are quite skeptical in their embrace of, of Christianity. Notwithstanding their diverse backgrounds and personal theological views, including diverse, diverse views on God, Jesus, and the divine origins and authority of scripture, the founders valued the Bible for its insights into human nature civic virtue, social order, political authority, the rights and duties of citizens, and other concepts essential to framing a new political society. There was in particular broad agreement that the Bible was a useful handbook for nurturing the kinds of civic virtues that give citizens the capacity for self-government in a republic. For this reason, both John Adams and John Dickinson called the Bible, and I quote, the most Republican book in the world. Now, I want that just to sink in for a second. The Bible is the most Republican book in the world. I find that a remarkable statement. I've been reading, I've personally been reading the Bible for about 50 years. And I must tell you that not once in all those years have I picked up my Bible and said to myself, now for some good Republican reading, right? It's just not the way I think of the Bible. So why would John Adams call the Bible the most Republican book in the world? Well, he tells us why. He said that in order for Republican government to succeed, a self-governing people in such a regime must be virtuous. That's essential that we have a virtuous people. And nothing, Adams said, is better in nurturing the virtues required of citizens than the Bible. And for these reasons, he believes the Bible is this great Republican handbook, this great Republican resource for a self-governing people. In various representative assemblies of the age, as well as in pamphlets, political sermons, and private papers, founding figures appealed to the Bible for principles, precedents, normative standards, and cultural motifs to define their community and to order their political and legal experiments. Some founders saw in scripture, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, political and legal models, such as republicanism and separation of powers, that they believed enjoyed divine favor and were worthy of emulation in their own polities. Now let's also note here that the Bible was not an uncontested source of ideas. Neither did the founders always agree on the interpretation and application of scripture to the great issues they confronted, as is evidenced by bitter debates over slavery, the right to resist unjust rulers, and the like. And yet ideas and values informed by Judaism and Christianity and their shared sacred texts were rarely removed from these difficult conversations. The United States Constitution that was hammered out here in Independence Hall in the summer of 1787 gives evidence of a political vision informed in part by the Bible. And it included features that were familiar to a Bible reading people. Although it is difficult to establish definitively that constitutional provisions were taken from specific biblical texts, the lineage of selected constitutional principles can be traced back to biblical concepts that had previously found expression in Western legal tradition, especially in the English common law, as well as in colonial laws and customs. Convention delegates occasionally invoked the Bible in some surprising and interesting ways. For example, 
In the convention's waning days, during debate on the qualifications for public office, the venerable Benjamin Franklin spoke in opposition to any proposal that, in his words, and I quote, tended to debase the spirit of the common people. We should remember the character which the scripture requires in rulers, Franklin said, and here he's going to invoke Jethro's advice to Moses, in which he lays out qualifications for prospective Israelite rulers. And here I pick up with Franklin's quote, that they should be men hating covetousness, end quote. Now, I think this is a, a fascinating exchange. Again, this is part of Madison's notes of the convention debates. And why do I find it interesting? Well, Franklin is appealing to a biblical standard in this debate on a substantive constitutional provision. And he informed his audience in very clear and unambiguous language that his source was scripture. That was the term he used. And then he referenced, even quoted from a very specific biblical text. The text here is Exodus chapter 18, verse 21. Now, I think this is a, a somewhat rare illustration of how the Bible was used in constitutional debates. We're going to find a few where there is a, a, an apparent reference, allusion to a specific uh, biblical uh, uh, text. However, what I want to suggest to you that the Bible nonetheless is going to uh, assert a kind of influence in a variety of other ways. And, and I want to suggest three ways in which the Bible uh, and its influence is manifested on, on the con Constitution of the United States. First, general theological or doctrinal propositions regarding human nature, civil authority, political society, and the like, inform conceptions and in institutions of law and civil government. The Constitution's basic design defined by the separation of powers and checks and balances reflected an awareness of original sin, that story we read of in Genesis chapter three. And, and, and along with that, the necessity to guard against the concentration or abuse of government powers vested in fallen human actors. This biblical anthropology or this biblical view of humankind was expressed in the convention uh, debates and deliberations. James Madison, for example, acknowledged a fellow delegate's strong view regarding, and I quote, the depravity of men and the necessity of checking one vice and interest by opposing to them another vice and interest. The truth was, Madison concurred, that all men having power ought to be distrusted to a certain degree, end quote. So again, my point here is to say that there's a kind of biblical anthropology that's informing the deliberations over the structure of the Constitution, manifesting itself with this, this almost obsession with separation of powers and checks and balances. For another example, the Constitution's four oath provisions arguably mandated a profoundly religious act, again, reflecting explicitly theological propositions. Moral philosophers and constitutional framers in the founding era and well into the 19th century typically defined an oath as a solemn appeal to God for the truth of what is said by a person who believes in the existence of a supreme being and in a future state of rewards and punishments. Note that oaths of office and civic responsibility, ubiquitous in state constitutions and statutes in the founding era, were often explicitly premised on a belief in a future state of rewards and punishments. This draws us into a kind of biblical eschatology, I would suggest to you. There is further evidence of biblical influence on the Constitution's four oath clauses in the accompanying provisions permitting an affirmation in the alternative to an oath. These were almost certainly an accommodation for Quakers, Moravians, Mennonites, and other religious sects for whom oath-taking offended their religious scruples because they take literally the biblical injunction to swear not at all that we read in Matthew chapter 5. Second, 
The founding generation saw in the Bible political and legal models that they thought worthy of their consideration and perhaps incorporation into their political and legal systems. In Article 4, Section 4, the Constitution requires every state to maintain a Republican form of government. Here, of course, I'm referring to Republican in a small r sense, this idea of government by consent of the governed. The political discourse of the founding era is replete with appeals to the Hebrew Republic described in the Old Testament. And I'm referring here to that period in the history of Israel from the Exodus to the uh, coronation of Saul as king of Israel. And, and you find Americans looking at this, at this history before Saul's coronation as an example, a divinely inspired model for Republican government, a model worthy of emulation in their own political experiments. In an influential 1775 Massachusetts election sermon, for example, Samuel Langdon, the politically active president of Harvard College and later a delegate to New Hampshire's Constitutional Ratifying Convention said this, and I quote, the Jewish government according to the original constitution which was divinely established was a perfect republic. The civil polity of Israel is doubtless an excellent general model. At least some principal laws and orders of it may be copied to great advantage in more modern establishments, end quote. And I, I suggest to you that this is one of many, many, many examples of Americans in the founding era suggesting that there was something to be learned from this time in Jewish history, something to be learned about republicanism. From various biblical passages chronicling the Hebrew polity, some Americans derive support for specific Republican principles such as government by consent of the governed as exercised through representatives chosen by the people. And, and let's note here that most of what the founding generation knew about the Hebrew Republic, they learned from the Bible. They were well aware that ideas like republicanism found expression in traditions apart from the Hebrew experience. And indeed, they studied these traditions, both ancient and modern. And although the founders did not seek to replicate the Hebrew model in its details, its biblical precedent reassured them that republicanism was a political system that enjoyed God's favor. And that was enough for them to seriously consider what there was to be learned from this type of republican government. And again, there are many other examples of models of this nature. You can find Americans in the 1780s, for example, suggesting that a model for separation of powers is to be found and studied in Deuteronomy chapter 16, 17, and 18, where we read about the division of labor between prophet, priest, and king. This was a model of separation of powers worthy of their consideration. Third, the U.S. Constitution includes provisions that are almost certainly derived from or informed by the Bible and Christian doctrine and practice. Again, rarely did delegates at the Constitutional Convention cite scripture when proposing specific constitutional provisions. Rather, they discussed selected principles and practices that were widely accepted in Western legal tradition to have been informed by a biblical culture. And let me just start with one that I think is pretty straightforward. Probably not very controversial, but perhaps not terribly important either. And that is what we find in Article 1, Section 7, Clause 2, where we find that Sunday is accepted from the 10 days within which a president must veto a bill. This seems to me to be an implicit recognition of this idea of Sabbath, commemorating the Creator's sanctification of the seventh day of rest, the fourth commandment that this Sabbath be kept free from secular defilement. And of course, this is an idea that's been sort of translated into the Christian tradition of recognizing uh, Sunday as that day of rest. The Article 3, Clause 3, uh, sec uh, excuse me, Article 3, Section 3 provision that convictions for treason be supported by testimony, the testimony of two witnesses. This conforms to a familiar biblical mandate requiring multiple witnesses of malfeasance for conviction and punishment. And we find many references to this idea of the necessity of multiple witnesses in order for there to be 
a conviction. Deuteronomy 17.6 is one such uh, biblical text, but you find, again, numerous texts in Scripture referring to this principle, both in the Old as well as in the New Testament. The Fifth Amendment, framed by the First Federal Congress, prohibits double jeopardy or trying to defend it twice for the same offense. In, late for, in a late fourth century commentary, St. Jerome and legal scholars ever since said this was a principle found in the book of the prophet Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9. From these origins, the doctrine entered into canon law and, English, and later English customary law and was then transferred to American colonial codes and early state declarations of rights before it was eventually enshrined in the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. I think this is a particularly interesting example because the Supreme Court, in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in an opinion by Justice Hugo Black, uh, he sort of traces this very lineage of the principle of double jeopardy from, from Nahum up to uh, its, its uh, being embedded in the Fifth Amendment. Let me give you one last example. Commentators throughout American history have suggested that Christianity was incorporated into American legal culture in general and constitutional tradition in particular by way of the English common law. Now, as distinguished from statutory or civil law, the common law is the body of laws derived from principles, rules of action, customs and prior decisions or precedents of judicial tribunals. Now, the argument here is that a fun, and this is a, a fundamental and enduring question in Anglo-American jurisprudence, and that is, what is the basis, what are the origins of the common law? And uh, the, the, the most authoritative common law jurists in both England and American, well into the 19th century, asserted that Christianity is and always has been the foundation of the common law, and nothing in the common law is valid that is not consistent with divine revelation. Again, this is a very common assertion, and it's certainly not an uncontested assertion. But by the way, that formulation I just read to you, I have I've taken from Blackstone's commentaries. So the great English jurist is making uh, this kind of assertion, but he's not alone. Uh, Lord Mansfield and, and, and Lord Hell are among the great English jurists that make this particular uh, assertion. But here's, here's a, a significant poor, uh, point. A popular notion, what, what, notion was that insofar as the U.S. Constitution accredited the common law, the American people through their ratification of the Constitution, incorporated Christianity into their very organic law upon ratification and adoption of the Constitution. Now this claim has sweeping, sweeping implications for the proposition that Christianity and its sacred text have informed American law, including constitutional law. Legal scholars have identified additional constitutional provisions, and one, one might encounter as many as a dozen or two dozen other constitutional provisions that we could walk through, suggesting uh, biblical origins. And these include measures addressing due process of law, cruel and unusual punishment, and corruption of blood, just to give you a few examples. And again, the claim here is, is not that these are ideas only found in the Bible or only found in a Christian tradition, but they were found in a biblical tradition. And the suggestion here is that this would have been an avenue through which Americans in the founding era would have been informed about these ideas or would have been drawn to want to include them in their own constitutional tradition. Tracing intellectual influences is not always easy or certain. In fact, it's often complicated and downright messy. And one is well advised to bring a strong dose of humility to the enterprise. Simply counting the number of biblical quotations and references to God and Christianity in the surviving records of the Constitutional Convention is not the only way to establish biblical influence on the Constitution or the lack thereof. Evidence indicating influence is sometimes found in unusual and unexpected places. 
In the search for intellectual influences on the American founding, one must look wide and dig deep, and that includes plumbing the depths of civil law, canon law, common law for evidence of biblical influences that may have subsequently found expression in American law. Some years ago, in a cover story on the Bible in America, Newsweek magazine reported that the Bible, and I quote here, has exerted an unrivaled influence on American culture, politics, and social life. Now historians are discovering that the Bible, perhaps even more than the Constitution, is our founding document, end quote. In an increasingly secular age, the Bible's role in the nation's founding is much contested. Whether or not one accepts this statement regarding the Bible's place in the nation's founding, the evidence suggests, I believe, that the story of the American constitutional experiment cannot be told adequately or accurately without referencing the Bible. If we miss or dismiss the Bible's contributions to the American constitutional tradition, we distort our understanding of the nation's constitutional experiment in Republican self-government and liberty under law. In closing this evening, let me encourage us all to read, reread, and study the Constitution. And to better understand the Constitution, read Blackstone, read Montesquieu, read John Locke, and yes, read the Bible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Dreisbach, for a stimulating, illuminating, and important lecture. I am going to sum up the large ideas that I just heard and then ask our remarkable panel to debate and discuss them. But first, let me introduce them. Marcy Hamilton is Robert A. Fox Leadership Program Professor of Practice and Fox Family Pavilion resident, senior fellow in the Program for Research on Religion at the University of Pennsylvania. Wow, I should have taken a deep breath before <laughs> that one. Marcy is one of the leading scholars of religious liberty in America and contributor to the National Constitution Center's interactive constitution. And friends in the audience, I want you after this discussion <laughs> to download the interactive constitution and read the provisions on the religion provisions of the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. You'll see Marcy debating uh, uh, Michael McConnell and other great scholars, liberal and conservative scholars, agreeing and disagreeing on the core meanings of the provisions. Uh, we also are honored to have uh, Daniel Mark, who is the former chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and an assistant professor of political science at Villanova, uh, and Russell Shorto, an author, historian, and journalist whose recent book is Revolution Song, A Story of American Freedom, and the author of a New York Times Magazine cover story with one of the best titles I can remember and very relevant to our discussion tonight, How Christian Were the Founders. So I heard Professor Dreisbach make uh, among the following points. The Bible was influential to the framers and to the American founding. That the framers differed in their uh, conceptions of Orthodox Christianity, ranging from the more heterodox thinkers such as Paine, Franklin, and Jefferson to the more um, ones in the middle like Madison to the more orthodox ones like Adams, but that all frequently cited the Bible and that the Bible was more frequently cited than John Locke. Deuteronomy cited more frequently than John Locke. I heard that memorable phrase that he uh, attributed to Adams, that the Bible is the most Republican of of books because it uh, inculcated the civic virtue and self-restraint that was necessary for democratic uh, citizenship. And then he said that the Bible had at least three influences on the American founders. First, that the conception of original sin influenced the separation of powers. <clears throat> Second, he said that the framers looked to particular biblical institutions, in particular the notion that the uh, Jewish uh, uh, republic was the most republican of all 
uh, of the ancient republics. And third, he said that biblical provisions influence particular constitutional provisions, such as the Book of Nahum's influence on conceptions of double jeopardy. So lots of provocative points in there. Russell, if I may begin with you, your, your piece had the great title, How Christian Were the Founders. So you've now heard Professor Dreisbach are you persuaded by his arguments that although the founders differed in their allegiance to traditional and orthodox Christianity, all were influenced by the Bible and that the Bible did indeed influence the American Constitution or not? Um, first of all, I'm impressed by your ability to summarize. Uh, <laughs> very I have the, the text here so I can uh, see. <laughs> um, uh, Certainly, the America in the 18th century was overwhelmingly Christian, overwhelmingly a Protestant nation. Virtually all of the founders grew up with um, the Bible, uh, and so to say that uh, it was part, it was a major influence on them, I think, is without question. What I find myself wondering is, in in uh, Professor Dreisbach's very erudite um, uh, talk, is He's, he's identifying um, what, what, they were, what their project was. And if he is uh, simply stating it as it narrowly, which is what I think he used the word modest, making the modest uh, claim that they were influenced in framing the Constitution by the Bible, then I think that goes without saying almost. Um, but I wonder if he has a broader goal. And I wonder if that, I mean, if, for example, that broader goal was uh, to ally himself, to add to a body of scholarship from the religious right that is trying to assert that America truly was a Christian nation in its founding, and to use that as kind of a wedge, because then once you do that, then you, you allow for uh, a, a certain precedence on uh, whether it's gay marriage or or um, how discriminating against Muslims. I mean, you, you, you open kind of a Pandora's box there. So in terms of what the ultimate goal of this presentation is, I think if it's, if it's the narrow goal, I can, I can uh, go along with that. And if it's a broader goal, then I think it's, there's something problematic in that because while the founders were in fact overwhelmingly Christian, they, I mean, it's all the more remarkable that they took this step of making sure that the Constitution was not in itself privileging Christianity or any religion. And that, in fact, the only mention of religion in the Constitution is Congress shall make no laws concerning an establishment of religion. They're basically saying government's going to be here and religion's going to be there. Thanks. That's very thoughtful. And as you say, uh, one could accept uh, Professor Dreisbach's modest claim that the Bible was influential to the Constitution, but disagree vigorously, as scholars do, about the implications for that about contemporary doctrine. Let's start our first round, at least, with the more modest claim. Uh, Daniel Mark, are you persuaded by Professor, uh, by Daniel, if I may, by his uh, broad uh, thesis that the framers had differing degrees of orthodox allegiance, but were broadly influenced by the Bible? And if you want to tell us more about the particular gradations of, uh, of, of, of faith that the different founders ascribe to. That might be interesting as well. Uh, sure. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here as well. It's an honor to be uh, among such di distinguished commentators and a, a wonderful lecturer. He actually put me in a hard position uh, when I actually agree with most of what he said. It's much better to come in and have a lot to say uh, in disagreement. Uh, so I am largely uh, persuaded uh, by the claim. And I also do see it in the context of a broader, uh, a broader project, although not the one uh, that you say. Uh, for all of their differences, and you're absolutely right, of course, that there was a large spectrum of observance from founders who were uh, cutting out uh, the parts where Jesus performs miracles out of their personal copies of the Bible, all the way to, as you say, uh, much more orthodox people um, like John Adams. Um, for all of their disagreements, um, one thing, for example, the, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists had a lot to disagree about. They fought bitterly over the ratification of the Constitution. But one thing they agreed on uh, was that the Republic required virtue, uh, a Republic if you can keep it. And that virtue required religion. Um, when I teach introductory political theory uh, at Villanova, um, we read uh, Aristotle and then Augustine, and I ask them to think about uh, the different views of human nature and how the different view views of human nature uh, inform different views of the role of government. 
Um, and uh, it's kind of a trick question because the fact that we might see Augustine, uh, because of the doc his view of the doctrine of original sin, as much more pessimistic about human nature than, let's say, Aristotle, who sees man as a political animal, a kind of a natural telos for the human to be in political life. Um, even though we see it the way, we don't know um, whether uh, we don't know whether one or the other points to a view of more government or less government. On one hand, the pessimistic view might point to more government because the government is needed to restrain these wicked and corrupt people. On the other hand, who's going to populate the government? Uh, the same wicked and corrupt people. And so, so it doesn't necessarily point to one uh, or the other. The Federalist thought, as we heard in the lecture, um, that ambition would check ambition, as we read in the Federalist papers, or vice would check vice. Uh, and that, would one, that was one way to contend with the reality of the lack of virtue. The Anti-Federalists went further. The Anti-Federalists thought, um, well, gee, not only uh, are you going to endanger us by putting power uh, in the hands of necessarily corrupt people, that the vices would mul be multiplied through their exercise of power in a national government under the Constitution, but that actually the system being adopted under the Constitution would undermine virtue directly because it was built to create a commercial society. Uh, and a commercial society based on profit um, would be something that would ultimately uh, be very harmful. Um, and so I think an intervention like the one we heard tonight um, is in part in the context of that broader concern, uh, namely that for all the things that the Constitution builds into its brilliant and in many ways successful design in order to ensure um, that naturally that, that fallen beings uh, could still have government and still uh, keep a republic um, for all of its designs without virtue, um, without virtue, uh, the republic would not survive. And whether we like it or not, um, the only cultural system that's been proven uh, to transmit values and teach virtue from generation to generation is religion. And that's why the founders across the broad spectrum really agreed um, that we needed religion to teach virtue uh, because we needed virtue to keep the republic. Thank you very much for that. Marcy Hamilton, you are uh, uh, among the most uh, eloquent uh, opponents in the, in the country of the idea that this is a Christian nation and of, uh, a, a, a defender of, uh, of the separation of church and state doctrinally, but just on the very modest historical claim, or on, on the historical claim that the founders believed that uh, religion was necessary to inculcate the self-restraint and virtue on which republicanism triumphed, and the surprising historical claim that the Jewish nation was the first perfect republic. What do you make of that? I think there's been an unfortunate slippage in the discussion tonight. Uh, there are founders and there are framers. The founding generation was religious in the sense that there was a religious identity that many of them shared. But what they shared was diversity. It was the Quakers in, the, in Pennsylvania who didn't let anybody else serve in public office but Quakers. Because only Quakers had the relationship with God that was adequate to serve in the government. It was the Puritans that killed Baptists and Quakers in Massachusetts. It is a false equivalence to talk about one category of religious believers at the time of the founding or the framer, framing. Instead, it was a teeming battle of sex, many of which did not want to live with each other, many of which shoved each other out. There was a deep identity of religious identity among people that was exclusive and not inclusive. And so the concept that there is any unifying religious viewpoint in the Constitution is problematic, but what I just described was the founding, the diversity of the founding, which was also quite Jewish, not in the Bible sense, but there were Jews here. There was true diversity at the founding of the United States, but it's now extraordinary diversity. We now have over 100,000 sects. You can't even keep up with it. Diana Eck at, the, at, the, at Harvard is, does, does a wonderful job of trying to keep up with the extraordinary diversity of religion in the United States. And what is the diversity of religion in the United States? It's as if, if you disagree, you just start your own group. <laughs> That's the American religious experiment. It is not that there is any kind of unity 
But I especially want to take issue with the concept that the framing, the moment of the framing, the framers were discussing the Bible. I've read all of it. No, they weren't. My favorite story from the framing of the United States Constitution across the mall was when it was suggested that they were just not getting along, and so maybe they needed a clergy person to open up their deliberations with a prayer. And then they all looked around and they realized that nobody was going to pay a member of the clergy. And that was the end of that discussion. <laughs> there was no opening prayer. There was no clergy person invited. In my view, yes, original sin plays in, but it becomes secularized at the convention. It's not because they were debating or even thinking in these terms. It's because the majority of framers were trained by Calvinists. A majority of the framers like Madison that went to college went and studied with Witherspoon at Prince, what is now Princeton at that point was called the College of New Jersey. What Witherspoon taught was the following, a heavy dose of Calvinism, don't trust anybody, divide power because anybody that holds power is going to abuse it. Right. That is the brilliance of the American Constitution. Not original sin, it's you just can't trust anybody. And that is what animates the entire Constitutional Convention, that you can't trust anybody, that anybody who holds power. But what, what the thing, and I'll close with this because I don't have no, no, too no, much no, time. No, no. The, the thing that I have to take the most exception on is the concept that republicanism is Christian. In fact, what Witherspoon taught, and I've read them all, what he taught in his lectures is the following. The government is like a watch. It's like a machine. And what we need to do is experiment. We need to put the pieces together. And there are three pieces that are equally valuable. You can have direct democracy. You can have republicanism, which is representative democracy. And you can have a monarchy. And what he taught Madison, and what Madison led everyone at the convention to discuss, was that government is just a matter of putting this watch together with pieces. None of them were better than the others. And the question was, can you find an experiment that works? And because you're fallible, it may not work. That was the animating thought at the convention. That's why there was so much debate about how do you stop abuses of power? What pieces do you put together? That's why there were framers who were still in favor of a monarchy at the convention. So, so I, I, I have to say I deeply disagree with the, with the notion that there is a unified Bible, that there is a unified Christianity at the start, but, but especially with the concept at the convention. They didn't discuss the Bible. In fact, if you read it closely, they really didn't care. They just didn't care about it. What they cared about was the United States was about to dissolve. They were in an emergency. They didn't know if they were going to succeed. And they had to figure out some kind of mechanism that might put it all together. So, Jeffrey, can so, I please, follow please, up on that? Please, please do and let me set it up by saying you have the title for your next piece, How Jewish Were the Founders. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, not but, the framers, but the founders. The founders. Right. But you, you heard Marcy's powerful point and, and, and the strong challenge she makes is that when the religious ideas of different varieties were uh, expressed in the Constitution, they were essentially secularized or filtered through this Calvinistic general mistrust of human nature that was not sectarian in any particular way. What is your sense of that? Uh, well, I, I just wanted to follow up on her point by making the observation that we look back 200 plus years at the founders and the framers, and this is our context. This is where, how, we, how we determine our own meaning. They were doing the same thing. They were looking back over the previous century and a half or so, which happened to be the great age of intolerance and religious warfare in Europe. And when people slaughtered one another, and by and large, there were Christians slaughtering other Christians. And uh, my um, expertise in history is really in the 17th century and in the, the Dutch period, the, du the period when the Dutch founded uh, the colony of New Netherland, which became New York. Um, and the Dutch in the 1570s, uh, in the middle of their war, their brutal, bloody war of independence against Spain, which lasted 80 years. And by the way, that was a war that the American founders looked at as a model 
for their republic because these were independent states that were banded together to fight uh, uh, for independence. In the middle of that, Spain launches the Inquisition on them. This blood, because while they were fighting for independence, the Dutch colonies were then uh, uh, converting to Calvinism. So there's this bloody horrific uh, result. And as a result of that, the Dutch craft this notion of freedom of conscience, which is really a watershed where, where they say, you will not be persecuted because of your faith. And it comes out of this hard experience. And that is one of the episodes that is the beginning of the Dutch enlightenment, which then seeds the wider European and ultimately the American enlightenment. And it's that kind of experience that was in the background that they were, that the founders of the American and the founders and the framers were looking at when, and that they had in mind as they were trying to put something together that could withstand those kinds of forces. Um, Daniel, you are, as it happens, uh, a fellow of the Witherspoon uh, Institute. Uh, Marcy mentioned that studying with Witherspoon at Princeton, the framers adopted this Calvinistic uh, mistrust of human nature. And my question uh, uh, to you is to what degree was the um, framers' mistrust, uh, well, to, to, uh, to, to what degree was their belief in freedom of conscience rooted in an idea of natural law that did depend on some idea of a creator, even if it was non-sectarian? The Virginia Declaration of Rights of 1776 says, religion or the duty which we owe to our creator must be founded on reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And you've quoted Jefferson's declaration about unalienable rights. So is it right to say that the basic notion of rights, of natural rights, came from God or nature, not from government, and in that sense, uh, the framers were influenced by faith. Oh, well, well absolutely, I, I think that's right. And um, Michael Sandel, who's a professor, famous professor at Harvard, is certainly not part of the Christian right or any conservative conspiracy, uh, has a really important article, I mean, again, uh, important among us academics uh, who study this kind of thing, religious liberty, talking about uh, the difference between what we sometimes mean now when we say freedom of conscience, which is the freedom to do whatever I feel like, uh, versus uh, the understanding that informed the founders and that led them to put these kinds of protections in documents, whether that was state constitutions or our national constitution. Uh, the idea um, that conscience requires us to do something uh, that we have no choice but to do. Uh, the reason the law makes an exception, let's say, for sab in freedom of religion for Sabbath observers uh, and not just for people who prefer to shop on a Saturday or a Sunday or something like that is because they're differently situated, because they feel they have no choice but to observe that day. And of course, um, the natural law and uh, canon law in the church, in the Catholic church, uh, developed um, simultaneously, and certainly the idea of having a duty um, that which one cannot but do um, starts with the idea of having, having a duty to God. I mean, the duty to a conscience before a duty to God um, certainly existed among you know, pre-Jewish, pre-Christian Greeks, um, uh, but also came to the West certainly uh, through Christianity. Um, it's interesting that it, it may very well be, I think it's an exaggeration to say that uh, the founders, maybe for rhetorical effect, that the founders didn't even care uh, about, or the framers didn't care uh, about the Bible. But I don't think the point is only whether they were discussing the Bible as the Bible. Um, there's, uh, it, um, in the 20th century, it was very popular to explore the classical roots, which is to say the Greek and Roman roots uh, of the American founding and even uh, of the framing. Uh, and uh, as a result of this, in the late 20th century, uh, a small field in the history of political thought arose called political Hebraism. And the scholars of political <laughs> Hebraism, and I'm sure, of course, Dr. Dreisbach is, is aware of this, the, uh, the, the scholars of political Hebraism were saying, well, sure, there are classical roots to the American founding, but there are also Hebraic roots. And by Hebraic, interestingly, um, they meant a biblical, certainly, um, but also rabbinic uh, or Talmudic. It's interesting that John Locke, a Christian in England, thought it was worth it uh, to learn Hebrew. Uh, so that he could read uh, the Hebrew Bible in the original. Um, people of that generation, English and Dutch uh, political thinkers of the early modern period um, who were even studying the Talmud, 
uh, and remarkable to think they were doing this. So it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily come down to um, whether they were reading the Bible uh, in the narrow sense or discussing it, but their political thought was steeped in the concepts that came uh, from those areas, not those, con not those alone. It's obvious that the mix of monarchy, rep republicanism, and direct democracy also comes to us from Rome. The Senate's called the Senate for a reason. Um, but there were other sources uh, as well. Political Hebraism. Now, this is just getting so Jewish, Marcy. I, I love it. But what, I didn't start it. No, you didn't start it. But, it, but what, do you, what should we make of this claim that, uh, what would you make of this proposition? That Jefferson, like the founders and framers, believed that our rights came from God or nature, not from government. That this conception of natural law was ecumenical enough to include Jews as well as Christians as well as other uh, people of faith but that in that sense the founders did have a conception of rights that stemmed from the divine. I, I think it's a vast and unfortunate overstatement that unfortunately plays into current politics. Um, I mean, I'm going to have to be completely honest here, which of course I never am. Um, <laughs> but I am, I, am, I am deeply concerned that the Liberty Bell and Carpenter Hall and the National Constitution Center are going to be joined by a Faith and Liberty Center. I have to say, that is, that is a product of today, of the attempt to take over the concept of the culture as though it is just Christian, as though it is just faith. What gives me real hope, though, is my students. I teach law, religion, and politics at Penn. And my students overwhelmingly they just don't have much time for organized religion. And of course, that's what the Pew Foundation re has repeatedly found. Organized religion, the notion that there is a, uh, you know, a book that has all the answers is not consistent with their viewpoint. Their viewpoint is very consistent with the founding and framing generation, which was deist, heavily deist people who believed in a greater power but did not believe in the specifics of the Bible and they didn't have a lot of time for it. Deism controlled the intellectuals, the literati at the time. And so I, you know, I, I think that we want to be very careful. There is no question the Bible has been extremely powerful and a powerful force in the United States. But so has Greek and Roman history. I completely agree with that, especially at the time uh, of the framing and those sitting in the, in the room framing the Constitution. I think they were more thoughtful and thinking about Rome and Greece than they were thinking about Christianity or about uh, what, what the Bible would require or would want them to do. But again, I'm going to emphasize my resistance, my deepest resistance is the concept that there was a concept at the convention that religion provided a, a special preference for republicanism, or that Christianity did. It just, it, it, if you read the notes of the debates, that's just not what you get. If you read, uh, and we'll go out of the, we'll do a framer, but out of the convention, James Madison and the Memorial and Remonstrance, what was his greatest fear? And this goes to the whole concept of this awareness of um, assault and abuse of, of religious believers. One of the most important lines in the Memorial and Remonstrance is Madison's fear of clericalism, his deep fear of the Inquisition. What he said was that it is possible to recreate the Inquisition in the United States. That's basically what he said. It is an amazing section that no one wants to talk about because it is scary. And what he's saying is too much power to religious entities is a problem. So what I would look at at the Constitutional Convention and what they feared the most was a union of power between church and state. And I fear that we are now getting incapable of talking about the separation of church and state. The framers got it. They had to get the separation of church and state because so many of them had escaped. The problem is for the ones who escaped Europe where they were being treated so badly, too many of them came over and they didn't know any other way. 
So what they sought out was their own universe where they in turn treated non-believers or anti whatever their faith was badly. It took us a long time to come up with how to live together as a diverse country. Uh, so my fear is that we make the mistake of thinking that there was a unified set of thoughts. There was one book that was preeminent over the Constitution. Uh, it's just not borne out by the history. Uh, Russell, what, what, what is deism? And what were the strains of it? And did the deists who thought uh, believed in a watchmaker God, some doubted the divinity of Christ, others uh, accepted it but doubted some of the miracles. Describe the range of thoughts of what deism meant and what the implications um, are. I'll, I'll go back to Spinoza because I think it kind of originates there. Uh, and again, I'm back in the 17th century in the Dutch context, um, he conceived, he, he feared uh, a lot of organized religion because it was human controlled and because it, was, it, it contained what he called superstition. Uh, so he tried to create a, uh, a view of God that was sort of impossible not to believe in. God is, um, God is nature, uh, sort of super nature. It is nature and everything that we can think of that happened, that just goes on. And therefore we are part of it, and therefore you can't not believe in this God. And so I think de American deism comes, comes out of that. And if you just backing up and looking at it in philosophical terms, the way philosophers look at human conception of reality, you've got the ph phenomena, the world of phenomena, things that we can touch and feel, and noumena, that which we can't, but which we somehow feel and want to interact with. And I think there's the false dichotomy when it comes to dealing, trying to understand the generation that created the American project, that it had to be one or the other, that they had to either support this reason project or, or they had, and therefore they were just giving lip service to Christianity, or the other way around, as some would put it. And it's possible, it is possible to do both. That it is possible to hold both of those conceptions in your mind, and it was possible for many of them. Many of them may have been closet atheists, but didn't want to assert it because it wasn't uh, politically correct. But uh, in different measures, you see different ones. Uh, the, maybe the most famous example is Thomas Jefferson's Bible, which he did a couple different versions of, where he basically cut out all of the miracles and just lined up Jesus' sayings, Jesus' philosophy. That was his very tangible way of dealing with this, you know, saying my re it's an affront to my reason, which I, going, following in this tradition that I uh, believe in very, uh, d very uh, sincerely, uh, it's an affront to my reason to think that someone literally walked on water. Um, however, I'm a Christian, and here's, so here is, the, here is the Jesus, here's the Christianity that I believe in. And basically, we all do things like that, whether we're Christians or Jews or non-believers. I mean, we have our, our uh, I mean, my father was a, has been a Catholic all his life, but he, I never once remember him going to church. I think that's, you know, people make their accommodations. The, the, the founding father that I have studied the most is Washington. And Washington, his mother uh, was very devout, but she was idiosyncratic to say the least. She was kind of a backwoods woman. She would go to a place of rocks and trees and pray. So she would kind of, it's not, you get this feeling of you know, her own kind of deism almost. Uh, Washington himself, when people observed him, uh, he, he belonged to church. He, he, he went to church irregularly, but he went throughout his life. Uh, and yet he wouldn't kneel, he always stood. Um, he wouldn't take communion. His wife would go to communion, but he wouldn't take communion. Um, so he had his accommodations, which again, again, I think, are his way of, of trying to square this circle, of trying to have it both ways. Daniel, I must ask more about choosing the founding because I'm really <laughs> interested in it. So Russell has just said that uh, you know Spinoza, of course, was the uh, proto-deist or an inspiration of, of that uh, conception. And were uh, Jews at the framing more theistic, uh, or were there some uh, Jewish deists? And say more about this incredibly provocative suggestion that uh, ancient uh, Israel was the perfect republic in the sense of the first representative uh, democracy. 
Sure. Well, I, I, and I confess that that is not, uh, though obviously Jewish, uh, I don't specialize in the Jewish founders or anything uh, of that sort. <laughs> We've um, got to start up a rudge. And so, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. I think in any case, I think it's going to fall to the Orthodox Jew on the stage to defend Christian America. So I'll get to that next. Um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, there were, uh, I mean, the, no, the, the Jews, um, uh, no, the Jews at the founding were not uh, necessarily more orthodox. I mean, they may have been observant in their ways, but they were also in some ways products uh, of the same environment. It wasn't the uh, more, as we say, like old world Jews who came over uh, in the 20th century. Jews also wanted to come to America, and I, I don't, not describing necessarily every single one in the United States, but wanted to come to America and be part of the American society uh, and assimilate, again, not assimilate to the uh, degree that they are today, but in, in their own time, uh, they, they were modern. Um, uh, there are definitely uh, resources out there that one can find on uh, Jewish influences uh, on the founding. Uh, Mayor Soloveitchik, who's a, a rabbi in, in New York City, uh, has a, a series of lectures um, on this sort of thing. Um, as far as, the, uh, as, far as the, the Jewish Republic, I would only have to assume um, that imagining the Hebrew Republic as, um, as the, the first or only perfect republic was really one of those in theory but not in practice, right? <laughs> All the Bible is, the Jewish Bible, is just a story of the Jews messing up. Right. Uh, so, right, it's just one, uh, right, it's one, one wayward generation after the next, right? And uh, God regretting over and over and never giving up but regretting over and over. Um, and so it'd be hard to find, but it is true in the field of political Hebraism um, that I mentioned, um, certainly focuses on the way Dr. Trisbach talked about separation of powers as an idea. Um, the Acton Institute, uh, which is a partner in the kind of work uh, we're doing tonight, they have a summer program called Acton University. It's, it's open to the public, and I, I teach a couple of courses there each summer, one of which is called uh, Judaism and the Idea of Limited Government. And there are a uh, whole, I would certainly not make the claim um, that Judaism is the sole or primary source of limited government. And nevertheless, there are certainly uh, biblical and rabbinic ideas, strands, um, that support that kind of thinking. Um, if I may, just because uh, shots were fired, uh, and there's, there's a lot that I, uh, 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 that I disagree with, and I won't, um, I won't nearly try to touch on everything, but to really come to the bigger point that connects to the lecture, um, I think there is a bigger project and a bigger picture here, but I don't think it's captured by um, certainly not an attempt to Christianize uh, America, and certainly not um, uh, certainly not by an attempt to say that all the, all the founders uh, were of one mind when it came to religion or the Bible or something like that. Um, I think that the, uh, so let me get at it this way. I think that the uh, most important debate going on today in political theory, maybe that's where you fall asleep, but I know that's not, <laughs> not necessarily not the, because the most important debate in political theory is actually not the debate between conservatives and progressives, though that debate surely in our country is the loudest, the most rancorous, and in the short term, the most consequential, but actually a debate um, that's getting a little bit louder and going on among conservatives. At the beginning of this uh, calendar year, if I'm correct, uh, Yale University Press published a book by uh, Patrick Deneen, a professor at uh, Notre Dame, uh, called Why Liberalism Failed. And, and just to be clear here, uh, he doesn't mean liberalism as in MSNBC, Barack Obama, that sort of thing. He means, uh, he means uh, classical liberalism, which is to say the kind of liberalism we associate with the founders and with John Locke. And his claim is further than the anti-federalists, not just that a commercial republic um, is, is dangerous for virtue, um, but that a regime focused on individual liberty um, is dangerous for virtue. Um, conservatives today typically say that the problems we have in America are because we've strayed from our founding and our founding principles. That's a standard thing you'd hear. The argument of conservatives like Deneen is in fact that the problems we have, in America, problems we have today in America are a playing out of fulfillment of the principles adopted at the founding. That the world we live in today in our country is the fruit of the poisonous tree. How so? Uh, because the founding was too much John Locke uh, and not enough Christianity or religion, or it's not that he's particularly concerned with Christianity necessarily in the narrow sense, um, but, but what, with what the pre-modern world represented in terms of authority, community, and tradition. Why? Uh, we see so many commenters, commentators today um, who talk about the way our obsession with autonomy has led citizens to be less happy, uh, less productive, morally adrift, and so on and so on and so on. This is uh, a lot written about. This is our modern or maybe our, our postmodern world. Um, 
And uh, whether our current condition is in fact a betrayal of the founding or a fulfillment of the founding depends on what you think of the founding. Uh, is the founding too much John Locke, uh, too much individual liberty and not enough authority, community, and tradition? Uh, or or um, which is it, too much individual liberty uh, or, um, or not? Um, and that depends, and I think someone like Dr. Dreisbach, uh, for those of us like me, um, who are not with Patrick Deneen, though I respect him and like him very much, and I think it's a great conversation. I don't agree with him, and I think we should fight uh, to save uh, what's good about our founding uh, rather than scrap it and start all over. If that were not the case, I wouldn't be wearing a tie whose pattern is entirely comprised of 1776 over and over again. I don't <laughs> nice. know if C-SPAN can get close enough, but you may not want to um, for other reasons. Um, Why not 1787 for next yeah, time? Right, right. no, I, I know that, but I didn't have a 1787 tie. Uh, I assume I I'm getting we, we got them cheap in the different yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Half price for you. So, um, <laughs> But I'm aware, I'm okay. aware. Uh, and I think that um, for those of us not on that side, I think Dr. Dreisbach gives us hope, not because he tells us that the founders were of one mind, or not because he's part of, a, of an effort uh, to restore the idea of Christian America, overturn separation of church and state, uh, but because he gives us hope for those who want to defend the founding, um, that religion, uh, including the Christian religion, of course, especially the Christian religion, was deeply important to the founding, and the Constitution we inherited, not as a document seen as a vacuum, black and white on text, but the whole political tradition we inherited and its institutions and its systems uh, are not so Lockean, which is to say so individualistic that it necessarily corrupts uh, the non-political institutions that are necessary for virtue, authority, community, tradition. Um, and so I think that's probably where I would see the most important um, and hopefully intended contribution uh, of the project. But where do you go with that exactly? Where do you go with that notion that, 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 there, that, that there is this, I mean, what I, what I found in Dr. Dreisbach's uh, presentation was uh, the idea that, well, religion, I mean, it's almost like saying the, the framers breathed oxygen and therefore oxygen is part of you know, the American Constitution. I mean, well, it's... I'm pretty it sure is, we can distinguish between intellectual influences and biological necessity. Well, but if right? we're talking yeah, about influences like that. that were not, that were not, uh, 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 that, that were not conscious, I mean, well, well conscious. It, I guess, it was well, I guess in that, the air. Was I guess what that's you a pretty grew good up with. No, that's. I think that's a pretty good debate. I think that a lot of what we heard in the lecture showed that it was quite conscious. I mean, the the quoting over and over and over again. Now you could say quoting it just for effect or quoting it for you know as rhetoric, but it seemed to be it was very much in their conscience. But but, but if, it wasn't quoted at the convention, right? So we're talking about the framers. They weren't quoting the Bible at the convention. And if your only person is Ben Franklin. He's using it for his own ends. Well, so it, 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 that's, no, that's that, a fact. No, no, and that's a fair point. But I think that's because I think that's because they also respected the political project. They really did believe in religious liberty. They really didn't want a sectarian government. But I'm not arguing that they wanted a sectarian government. They were creating Christian America. I doubt that's what I haven't ever spoken to him. But I except to say hello today. But I don't. I doubt that's what. I think what he's what uh, what what they're arguing is that. Um, the political institutions came from a tradition um, that was biblical and religious, and the institutions reflect those influences in very important ways that mean, at least for my purposes, contra Deneen, um, that we don't live in a system that is necessarily cannibalistic. The classical liberal world does not, as uh, Nick Walterstorff, theologian said, does not cut off the branch on which it sits because it is not so individualistic, so atomizing as to destroy destroy the very virtues that makes an individual liberty-based society possible. But again, you know, I'm, I'm on the I, other I, side I, of the looking glass. Yeah, that, yeah. That, <laughs> and, that doesn't make any sense under the Constitution. I'm sorry. The, well, go ahead. The Say only what? entities in the United States that are routinely arguing for autonomy from the law are religious entities. They made up something they call the church autonomy doctrine, and they use it to argue they're not liable and they're, they're not responsible and they, don't they can't be sued and they can't be responsible for things like sex abuse of children. So the, the autonomy is not built into the constitutional interpretation at all. Uh, and in fact, the Supreme Court has rejected it routinely because you can actually find a universe within the Constitution of getting along and operating together and respecting the law. I think where we radically disagree here 
is on what was going through the minds of the founding and framing generation. Right. And what those who favor this, this world view of the Christian influence never bring up, but is so important, is what the founding generation feared most was what they called licentiousness. They believed right. that there was something that was too much liberty. They believed that you could go overboard. They opposed polygamy. They opposed sex with children. They opposed bestiality. They opposed using the Constitution for purposes of serving your own ends. Licentiousness was an evil at the time of the framing. Uh, so the religious liberty that we are experiencing right now, the arguments which are, as you said, that I, can, I have to do whatever it is my faith tells me to do, was flatly rejected at the time of the framing. They believed in limits on action. They believed in the rule of law. They believed in what makes the system operate. Uh, and it wasn't just because they were religious. It was because they understood tyranny, because they came from tyranny. So I, I think that the, the, you know, the, I understand this is a debate right now uh, over autonomy, but it's not in constitutional interpretation. Oh, I just want to cut, just on the autonomy point, just as a very narrow, t when I use the term autonomy, I certainly didn't mean anything about the autonomy of religious groups. I meant the philosophical idea of individual autonomy, the debate we have today <laughs> about whether, um, whether human beings are truly the authors of all meaning and all values, or whether those, the, that meaning and values come from somewhere else, whether that's a, a, the, a, a theological God with a capital G, or whether that's the natural law. Um, but certainly the idea that licentiousness was an evil comes from two sources. It comes from Plato and Aristotle on one hand. Licentiousness. And it, and what? Licentiousness. Licentiousness, right. yes. Not um, uh, yes, was right. The, the classical distinction for in the, in the classical tradition was between liberty and license, just as That's you right. said, right? That's liberty, right. which was the freedom to do good, and license, which is the freedom to do anything you please, uh, right. including the the uh, um, the things that you mentioned. Certainly, uh, famously prohibited by the Bible against pagan society uh, of its time. Um, and the two sources were Plato and Aristotle on one hand, and Moses and Jesus, you know, representing greater traditions, on the other hand. Um, that's where the founders, the idea, that le the idea of evil, I mean, this is, where, uh, this is certainly where they got those ideas. And true, they wanted ordered liberty. I couldn't agree with you more, but they wanted ordered liberty because they understood these ideas about virtue that were at once classical, Greek and Roman. And, and the, the idea that the yeah. moral precepts of that generation go back ultimately to <laughs> biblical concepts, again, to me, seems completely non-controversial. It's right. just a matter of, if there was, as I think you're saying, some kind of overt project among them to take elements that were biblical and put them into the framing of the nation, uh, what, what is, the, according to that logic, what is behind that? You mean, why did they believe in ordered liberty? Why, why did they want no, ordered liberty? No, I mean, that's, that's a, a reasonable sort of universal value. But well, universal on what it's, it's an it's innovation not, of the West. It's hardly a universal value. It's an innovation either of the Greeks and the Romans. Well, it, we or now of perceive the it as a, yeah, right. Yeah, but in totally both of those, universal. it would have come from both of those streams to them. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I, that's why I'm I'm certainly the what we're calling the political, uh, the, sorry, the classical and the Hebraic traditions, uh, absolutely both fed but into. But my point is, not, so yeah. what? I mean, we we know that they had these traditions behind them. Yeah. Uh, end of story. And they, and they used those building blocks to create this what? new kind of system, which was, right. and, so I think you one, argue that. Yeah. and I think one of the quotes that, uh, that Dr. Dreisbeck uh, uh, referred to in his lecture uh, was something like a godless framework, meaning the Constitution, and it, my, what immediately came to my mind was, it's possible to have a biblical background and using elements of that create a godless framework right. for a moral society. Oh, yeah, th absolutely. That's completely, that, that's completely fine and agreed, but it depends what we mean by godless society. Um, no, moral no, no, society. No, no. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, a, a godless framework. I'm sorry, you said godless framework for moral society. Sure, in the sense that nothing was required of religion. I'm completely with you on religious freedom and how religious freedom is the first bulwark against tyranny. Uh, in, in, no, well, we don't agree on that in, at all. No. I would never say that. Okay, but, <laughs> but uh, sorry, taking from the point that you said about religious groups that are the ones that are pushing back the most against government or... 
No, 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 no. I no, you misunderstood. Religious groups are the ones abusing their current power too much. Ah, okay. That I thought was it was something point. else you said. In any case, um, that's a different uh, point. That's uh, the framers' point. I thought I agreed with one thing you said about religious freedom, but maybe not. No. Um, <laughs> I, I, it, in any case, um, I think the point is that they still recognize that the godless framework for a moral society require. If if all three branches conspire together to despoil the nation, they can do that. I mean, at least maybe till the next election, but probably. Even even so if they cancel the elections or who knows what. And so it's required, uh, and they, so they knew that no design could survive without underlying virtue, and they believed that the virtue also required religion. The only natural law at That's the National great. Constitution Center is that uh, discussions must end on time. time. <laughs> <laughs> this one is not is easy precept? to summarize, except that it has been superbly lively, and our evolution from the question of whether uh, the founding was uh, too uh, Christian to the question of whether it was not Christian enough uh, reminds all of us how much more we have to learn. Friends, National Constitution Center members, learners of all ages, you must read to educate yourselves about these debates so that you can make up your own mind. You must read Daniel Dreisbach's Reading the Bible with the Founding Fathers, Marcy Hamilton's God versus the Gavel, The Perils of Extreme Religious Liberty, Russell Shorto's Revolution Song, A Story of American Freedom, and anything written by Daniel Mark. Please join me in thanking our panelists.